Hey everyone, my name is Nick Wignall. I'm a clinical psychologist and the founder of The Friendly Mind, a free weekly newsletter where I share practical, evidence-based advice for emotional health and well-being. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about depression, specifically three hidden risk factors for depression. These are things that I saw over and over and over again when I was working with folks one-on-one -on -one who, who struggled with chronic depression. And even though they were obvious to me, because that was my job, literally working with people who struggle with these things, I saw the patterns, right? But people who were struggling with depression often didn't see these at all. So they'd continually get hit by episodes of depression that felt out of the blue. They didn't understand why it was happening to them. So if you do struggle with chronic depression, some of these risk factors are very likely to be going on in your life. And if you can learn to identify them and become more aware of them, that's the first most essential step to starting to modify them and change them so that you can be more resilient to depression in the first place. Number one, constant busyness. Now, in some ways, this might seem like kind of a counterintuitive risk factor for depression. Uh, after all, we tend to associate with depression with sluggishness, lack of activity and motivation, and in fact, some of the best approaches to overcoming depression have to do with increasing your physical activity. There's an approach called behavioral activation, which is incredibly underrated, really, really effective. And it basically involves when you're depressed, kind of forcing yourself to do small, meaningful activities and behaviors every single day, whether or not you feel like it. And this is a phenomenally effective treatment for depression, actually. But here's the thing. Remember, we're talking about risk factors for depression, not symptoms of depression. And there's this funny thing where very often the things that make us vulnerable to, to depression often look like almost polar opposites from how we look once we already are depressed. For example, take not getting enough sleep. If you struggle with chronically poor sleep, this can make it more difficult to manage difficult emotions and thoughts um, in a healthy way, things like anxiety or anger or guilt, um, anything like that. As a result, we tend to fall back on less helpful coping strategies, things like avoidance or rumination or worry, self-criticism even. Um, and these things, long-term, tend to only mo make those difficult emotions more intense. You criticize yourself a lot, you're gonna feel more and more sad or guilty. Eventually, this combination of sort of low mood and a lot of negative thinking patterns, this can be a cause or a trigger for depression, for a depressive episode in the first place. But once you're depressed, one of the most common symptoms of depression is actually hypersomnia, sleeping too much. So again, we see the symptoms of depression, sleeping too much, for instance, can often look completely different than the things that contributed to that depression's rise, something like a lack of sleep or not enough sleep. Now, of course, remember, the lack of sleep, it's not that that caused depression, right? But it was one of many risk factors that increased the probability that you would fall into a depressive episode. But the bigger point here is that it looks can be deceiving. And when it comes to physical activity, while being constantly active and busy might seem like a really good thing to stave off depression, it can actually be a risk factor for it. And that happens in one of two primary ways in my experience. The first is busyness as a form of emotional avoidance. Now, a lot of people who are chronically busy, constantly in motion, always doing stuff, never sitting still, even whether they realize it or not, one of the things they're doing is they're using busyness as a way to avoid having to look at or deal with some sort of uncomfortable inner experience usually an emotion, some kind of difficult emotion, right? The problem is, while this feels good in the short term, being busy and constantly having stuff to do and occupy your mind, it gives some relief. It allows you to kind of escape those difficult feelings when they pop up. Long term, it actually fragilizes you because when you're constantly avoiding something, you're teaching your brain that that thing is dangerous and making you more afraid of that thing. So that difficult emotion <laughs> you keep uh, sort of running away from with your constant busyness you start to get more and more and more afraid of it and less and less confident in your ability to handle it. Because understandably, you keep avoiding it instead of trying to handle it. So here's an example um, to kind of illustrate this principle from a former client of mine. Now this client was a kind of mid 60s woman um, and she harbored a tremendous amount of sadness and guilt 
uh, because her son had a really major drug problem. He was a drug addict. But to avoid these feelings, she got in the habit unconsciously of constantly being busy, just constant busyness. Um, she was working nonstop in her very demanding job. Uh, she exercised fanatically, and even in the little like kind of free or spare time that she had, she volunteered for multiple charitable organizations. So just literally booked solid weekdays, weekends, nights, mornings, whatever it is, constantly in motion doing stuff. Now, one of the interesting kind of tragic side effects of this constant busyness for, for my client was she almost never had enough quality time with important people in her life including really good friends and family members and loved ones. And as a result of this, it became increasingly awkward and difficult for her to have kind of meaningful one-on-one -on -one interactions where she was able to go a little bit deep, be a little bit vulnerable um, with anyone really, but especially with people close to her. Um, it just became hard because she never did it. And like anything, if you don't do something, you, um, you often kind of you get out of practice with it and then it becomes harder and more awkward and you do less of it and the cycle just gets worse and worse and worse. Now, eventually, a lot of her most important relationships began to lose intimacy as a result of this. So her spouse was one of them, um, a couple of her other kids actually, th this tended to happen to, and this lack of int intimacy leads to kind of isolation and loneliness. So she, because she was so busy, she was not spending good quality time with people, which resulted in lower intimacy. And even though she still had a lot of relationships, a lot of friendships, um, she was, you know, she interacted with her family a lot. She increasingly felt lonely and separate from these people because there was no intimacy or there was a lot less intimacy there. So despite having kind of a high quantity of relationships, the quality of those relationships was really um, plummeting in a lot of ways because of this ultimately this defense mechanism of constant busyness. And remember, the ultimate point, the motivation behind that constant busyness for her was to, it was a way to avoid having to even think about, much less feel, the sadness and guilt she experienced um, as a result of her son's problems with drugs. Now, the issue here is that eventually she would get hit by big stressors, really big stressors in her life. I remember one of them was her son um, overdosed. He, he survived, but it was a really scary kind of touch and go scenario. And this event, in part because she had so little social support, like she was so kind of cut off in a, in a lot of meaningful ways from important people in her life, that's normally a buffer against stressful events, um, especially for people who are vulnerable to depression. But because she didn't have that or it was so weak, this event threw her into a depressive episode. So the key kind of points to realize, I think, from the story are that, remember, emotional avoidance was the motivation behind the chronic busyness. That's what kept that habit going. It's what got it started and it's what kept it going. Because she was unwilling to sit with and explore those admittedly very difficult emotions, but because she didn't do that, she needed this habit of constant busyness to avoid them or get rid of them. So that was the maintaining cause of this habit, which then made her more vulnerable to depression. And that's kind of the second point to keep in mind here is that the constant busyness made her vulnerable to depression. Did constant busyness cause her to be depressed? No, it, it's more of a secondary effect. The constant busyness led to a decrease in the quality of her relationships which then led to a lack of a buffer when she experienced a big stressor. And that's what kind of flung her into the depression. But it's important to keep in mind, even though the constant busyness didn't cause the depression, it definitely made her more vulnerable to it. So hopefully that serves as kind of an, uh, an example of this, um, this idea of chronic busyness being an avoidance mechanism for dealing with difficult emotions. Now, but the second way that chronic busyness can make you vulnerable to depression is that <laughs> this sounds dumb when you say it out loud, but uh, busyness is exhausting. It's really, really tiring and depleting. And if you know people like this, or maybe you're one of these people yourself, you know how despite the, in some ways, the energy you get and the excitement that comes from constant busyness and constantly doing things, you're, you're kind of always scraping the bottom of the barrel. You're really depleted in some important ways. 
So an, a client I had who, who um, I think describes this phenomenon or, or illustrates this phenomenon well, this was a, a young guy who was in his 20s, a young man who was in his 20s, and he had, <clears throat> he had talked to a previous therapist after having been depressed, and the advice the, the previous therapist gave him was to stay busy so that you don't get depressed again. That's literally what his previous therapist told him. So my client, who's a very um, earnest, earnest guy, very uh, kind of a rule follower, he really took that advice to heart. And he started saying yes to everything in order to stay busy so that he could stave off his depression because that's what his therapist told him he needed to do. So anytime a friend wanted to hang out, yes, sure, definitely can, no matter how tired and exhausted I am. Anytime his boss uh, proposed giving him a new project, he said, yes, totally, lay it on me, I'll take it. Anytime, he, he was kind of a self-help junkie, anytime he read some, some new book that described some new technique, whether it's like a mindfulness exercise or a, a breathwork exercise, he would just throw himself into it full bore. Now, all of these things, hanging out with friends, uh, taking on big projects at work, uh, doing self-development habits, none of, the, none of these things are bad in and of themselves, right? But if you're doing all of them all the time, that's completely overwhelming. And not only are you probably not doing any one of those things very well, but it's just, it's too exhausting. The, the, the energy required to maintain all that is going to wash out any positive benefits you might have from them. And that's really what, what happened with this, this young guy is that he, as a result of this kind of constant busyness, he was chronically stressed and actually really often he was sick just because he was, because he was in a state of kind of chronic stress. His immune system wasn't working super well and he was just kind of sick all the time. Nothing major or awful, but just, you know, a lot of colds, flus, viruses, all sorts of stuff um, that just kind of kept him in a not ideal space. Now, counterintuitively, <laughs> what, what this ended up doing is he, he was in the habit of making all these commitments, taking on all sorts of things, both for other people and for himself. But then because he was constantly exhausted and even sick a lot, he ended up um, not following through on a lot of these things. Some new exercise regimen or, or some you know, uh, event someone invited, he couldn't do it because he was too sick and tired a lot of the time. And as a result of this, his self-esteem started to decrease. And along with it, he started, he kind of fell into this habit of being really self-critical, a lot of negative self-talk. And this is actually why he came to see me. <laughs> he didn't come to me for depression, he came to me for um, basically negative self-talk and low self-esteem, and he wanted to figure out how to um, address those. And what I kind of discovered pretty early on here was that those things were just a symptom of this more general pattern of him falling into constant busyness as a way to <laughs> theoretically um, avoid depression. What was happening though is those that habit of kind of self-criticism, negative self-talk, which were driven by the constant busyness and always saying yes to things, those were actually increasing his likelihood of getting depressed. And in fact, he started having these, um, you know, at first it was just a small, it'd be like for a day or so, he'd just feel kind of down, right? And then he'd kind of spring back out of it a little bit. Um, but eventually these became both more frequent and more intense to the point where, I don't know, six, seven, eight, eight times a year, he was having pretty significant episodes of depression that in his mind were caused by this kind of tendency to get really down on himself, to really start beating himself up and criticizing himself. And while that's, that was partly true, what he didn't, he was sort of missing the forest for this particular tree <laughs> in the sense that the only reason that habit of negative um, self-talk and self-criticism had cropped up is because he was using chronic busyness. Um, he had developed this habit of chronic busyness as a way to avoid depression. So a really kind of vicious cycle. I felt really bad for this, for this guy. But luckily, we were able to start to work through this when I um, sort of started making him aware of this habit of chronic busyness and how, <laughs> despite the advice he got from his former therapist, this might actually not be such a great idea. It could actually be making him more vulnerable to depression. It was tough, but eventually things started to turn around for this guy. So again, just like the previous example, note that the chronic busyness wasn't the cause of him getting depressed, not in a direct sense, but it was definitely setting the stage for and causing a variety of other things, particularly the habit of self-criticism, that then was causing the depression. So no, of course, chronic busyness doesn't 
didn't cause this guy to be depressed. But, and in general, you, I don't think you should think of physical activity and, and even being busy as a bad thing or something that causes depression. The, the nuance here is that chronic busyness, it becomes problematic when you start using it, consciously or not, as a defense mechanism or a coping strategy for something else. Because as these two examples have shown, while very well-intentioned, this idea of keeping yourself constantly busy, it's actually a really misguided way of ultimately feeling better. Because the core problem here is avoidance. The more you avoid, rather than confronting and addressing your problems, including your problematic relationship with difficult emotions, like sadness or guilt, or, or fear of depression, right? In the, in the case of my second example there, ultimately the more emotionally fragile and the less resilient you are. Avoidance always leads to fragility. On the other hand, difficult as it is in the short term, when you approach those problems head on, whether that's you know guilt about your son's drug problem or your fear of getting depressed again, when you confront those and, and address them assertively, it's hard, but long-term, you become much more resilient to them. And as a result, your depression becomes less likely. So if you struggle with depression, it's really worth reflecting on and considering the role of busyness in your life. And the, I think the key question to ask yourself is, and it, this is hard, you really wanna be, try as best as possible to be really brutally honest with yourself and ask the question, am I busy because it genuinely makes me happy or at least to a large extent, am I busy as a way to avoid something? A difficult emotion, a relationship, a um, specific problem in my life, maybe even a memory. And if you're using busyness as a way to avoid something, that's a real red flag and you wanna look at that much more closely and start to ask yourself, is there a healthier way to deal with this problem or this difficult thing I'm experiencing rather than using chronic busyness to avoid it. Because as we've seen, while it might seem like a good idea in the short term, it could actually be the very thing that's making you especially vulnerable to depression. Number two, mimetic desire. Now, mimetic desire is this kind of unusual term for a surprisingly common phenomenon, which is we tend to want things because we see other people wanting them. Now, this the term comes from a, there was a Stanford professor, a literature professor named Rene Girard, um, and he, he died recently, but this was maybe uh, 20, 30 years ago, so where he was uh, kind of active in developing this theory. Um, but his theory said that despite the intuition most of us have that our desires, what we want, is the result of either what we are, have chosen or is just kind of an innate thing within us, he said that's not actually what happens most of the time. Most of the time, what we want is mediated by other people. Specifically, what we see other people wanting, we take as a proxy for what we want. So some um, kind of simple examples of this. <laughs> you know, uh, Do I want a new iPhone because I've spent hours doing a really subtle, careful cost-benefit analysis that looks at all the features and compares them to other phones and I've determined that given my use cases and values and temperament and all this kind of stuff, the iPhone really is you know, just the best choice for me. Mm, now, if I'm honest, it's because I see a lot of my friends and peers using the iPhone, and frankly, Apple is just really good at marketing, especially to people like me. And so really, I want the iPhone, not necessarily because I intrinsically want it, but because I think I should want it based on what I see other people wanting. Another example of this would be um, yoga. <laughs> so do it for a long time, I've said, I, you know, I wanna start doing yoga. I haven't actually started doing it yet, <laughs> but I really want to. But if I kind of interrogate that wanting a little bit more closely, I have to ask myself, do I want it? Because I, again, I've really done a lot of careful, thoughtful reflection about, about yoga as a practice and its benefits and how it's gonna help me, especially relative to other kind of health and well-being practices and other things I could do. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> to be honest, I want I want to do, start doing yoga because I see a lot of very attractive, fit-looking people on social media and online in various places 
talking about how much yoga has improved their lives. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's not true. It's just that I don't, I don't think I want it ultimately because I want it. I want it because I see other people wanting it and therefore want it for myself. Or maybe even take as another example, a much bigger, in a lot of ways, kind of desire, like a profession. I used to see this a lot when I, when I did therapy with folks. But, you know, an example would be, did you really know that at the age of 18, deep down, you wanted to be a doctor? And that you, um, you know, being an orthopedist and repairing torn ACLs every day, that was like your calling and the path for you? Did you know that? Or could it have been <laughs> that your desire to become a doctor was much more about, that's just what you saw a lot of the kind of impressive people in your life, in your young life, that's what you saw them doing and that's what you admired. And even your parents, that's obviously something they wanted for you because say your mother was a doctor and her father was a doctor before her and it's in the family. So did you want it because it's intrinsic to you or do you want it because you saw other people wanting it, including wanting it for you? Now, I'm not saying this theory is the end all be all of the psychology of human desire. And I'm not even expecting you to kind of buy into this. It's certainly not wholesale. But what I would like you to do is really to keep an open mind about it. Because, you know, while I'm sure you, like everyone else, myself included, uh, we always think we're the exception to this sort of thing, right? Like, oh, marketing doesn't work on me. Um, but I would strongly encourage you to really think carefully about this idea of mimetic desire. That is, a lot of the time, what we want is less about what we really actually want deep down, and it's much more about what we see other people wanting. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, you know, what the hell does this have to do with depression and risk factors for depression? Well, if you think about it, a great way to end up being depressed is to live someone else's life instead of your own. If you spend too much of your time pursuing other people's goals rather than your own, it's very likely that you're gonna end up pretty unhappy, pretty frustrated, chronically resentful, regretful, and then depending on your unique kind of situation and vulnerabilities, depressed. For example, whom you choose to marry, right? You marry someone because they conform to most people, cultures, whatever, um, but other people's idea of the ideal spouse or partner. They're beautiful, they're charming, they're hardworking, they're successful. Great, let's do this. <laughs> Skip ahead a decade or two, and you actually come to realize through you know 20 years of painful experience that turns out deep down, I don't really care that much about you know nine out of 10 levels of beauty or charm or even having an intensely hard work ethic. What I really care about is someone who's kind and supportive, funny and easygoing as a partner. That's what I actually want in a partner or in a spouse. Trouble is I've, for example, got three kids already with this person and we've sort of built a life together. It's, it's complex. So I feel trapped, let's say, because I'm committed to this person who turns out I don't actually want to be with. Eventually this leads to just a lot of chronic frustration and resentment hopelessness, apathy, all of which make you far more vulnerable to depression. And ultimately, it's because you didn't have the awareness early on to know what you actually wanted. And instead, you used what other people wanted, what society told you you should want, what your culture said you should want, what your family said you should want, whatever, what your friends, you used that as a proxy and you copy and pasted that into yourself and said, yeah, that's what I want. And so you ended up living um, ultimately someone else's life rather than your own. Now, of course, this is very easy to do. Like we're all idiots when we're 20 years old, 25 years old, right? Um, and I think our culture doesn't have a good way to help us make more informed decisions about this. So I don't, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a really tough dilemma that a lot of people fall into. But what's, I think what's key to see here is behind it is often this mechanism of mimetic desire, kind of fooling yourself into wanting something, not because you actually want it, but because you see other people wanting it. Another example of this is in addition to um, choosing a spouse, you know, which is a big, huge, impactful decision in your life, another almost equally impactful decision is your choice of careers. And I used to see the role of mimetic desire a lot when it came to a career choice. So for instance, really common example would be the 
um, the person who embraced this, uh, the career as an attorney, say, because it looked like a really good profession. When they were in college, they were like, yeah, great. It's respectable. I make a lot of money. I get to argue for a living. Perfect. Turns out though, again, with a decade or two's worth of experience, maybe you realize, and I'm not saying this happens to everybody. <laughs> for some people, being an attorney really is a great path or being a rocket scientist or being a doctor or whatever it is, right? But for a lot of this hypothetical person, turns out for them and their kind of friend group, maybe being an attorney isn't as respectable a profession as they thought when they were in college. And while they do make a lot of money, but they also have to work 70 hour weeks every single week in order to do that. And while they do enjoy arguing uh, in court during trials, turns out that's like 3% of their time in their job. The rest of which is mostly spent in meetings in their firm and doing just really mind numbing amounts of paperwork and writing, which they do not enjoy very much. Unfortunately, you're stuck in a lifestyle though that this being an attorney provides. And even if you realize, hey, actually what I wanna do is teach middle school or be an artist or a musician or a firefighter, you're kind of stuck. It's pretty hard to make a huge career transition, not impossible, but pretty tough. And that stuckness leads to you're walking into work every single day, basically full of regret and disappointment about what could have been in your career, feeling bad that you didn't realize this early on. This regret then leads to a habit of brooding and rumination, which tends to make you kind of irritable and moody more often than you normally be. This starts affecting your most important relationships with your spouse and your kids. And all of this is because you didn't realize that you didn't actually want the things you thought you want. <laughs> you saw other people wanting them and you thought, yeah, great, copy paste, I want this. But turns out that's not actually, that career wasn't actually a good fit for you given your talents, preferences, and values. And this stuckness and the habits it leads to, like rumination and brooding, all these things then do become direct, potentially direct causes of depression. So the, the takeaway I think from this is that you don't want to assume that what you want is in your best interest because what we want is so fickle. It's so easy to want something that we don't actually want. And that's all because of this idea of mimetic desire. Our desires are powerfully, powerfully influenced and easily influenced by other people, by what we see other people wanting, which means we need to be really thoughtful and careful and deliberate and reflective when we, um, with our wants, with our desires, especially our wants and desires about big impactful things like who we choose as a partner, right? Or what kind of career we decide on, job we take, things like that. Otherwise, it's easy to end up sort of waking up, you know, 10, 20 years later, realizing, again, you're living someone else's life, not your own. And that is a tremendous risk factor for depression, at least for a lot of people. So the kind of final little twist on this or kind of implication of what we've been talking about is one of the best ways to stay resilient to depression is to increase your self-awareness. Now, true self-awareness though, everyone, you know, <laughs> we all think we're self-aware, right? Everyone thinks there's, it's one of those things where if you ask people how self-aware are you um, on average, everyone's gonna say they're above average on self-awareness. <laughs> um, but a lot of us are less self-aware than we think, at least in certain areas. And our own desires tend to be one of those areas where we have kind of a blind spot because it, it seems obvious, well, of course I know what I want. Uh, no, <laughs> you don't, I don't, we all don't a lot of the time, a surprising amount of the time. So becoming more self-aware about our desires and what we actually want is a really important skill for staying resilient to depression. And like any skill, it takes practice and repetition and some commitment to it in order to get it to a high level. Again, you wanna reflect on this question of when, when faced with a major decision, you wanna really ask yourself, do I really want this thing or do I want it primarily because I see other people wanting it? Number three, grief avoidance. Now, something I noticed early on when I started working with folks uh, who struggle with depression is that a lot of people who are chronically depressed were also chronically anxious too. Now, in some ways this makes sense because if you've been through an episode of depression, you know how awful it is 
right? how terrible, how terrifying, how painful it is. And so if you come out the other side, it's totally understandable that you would be uh, at the very least pretty nervous and hesitant, maybe full-blown terrified of getting depressed again. So even when you're out and feeling good, you're always kind of worrying. You're like looking over your shoulder or around the corner, you know, is depression right there, ready to pounce? And that just leads you to be kind of chronically anxious and hypervigilant and uptight. But it's not just anxiety about depression that's characteristic of people who struggle with chronic depression. It's also anxiety about sadness and about grief. In other words, a lot of people who struggle with chronic depression, they seem to be very nervous and anxious about getting sad or experiencing grief for things. And this shows up in a few primary ways that I'll walk through real quick. The first is that in their speech, they tend to intellectualize. So they substitute abstract, general, intellectual terms for more plain emotional language. So instead of saying, I'm mad, right, or angry, they'll say, oh, I'm just kind of bugged right now. They'll use a metaphor. They'll substitute a metaphor for the plain emotional word. Or instead of feeling, I'm a, instead of saying, I'm afraid, they'll say, oh, I'm just kind of stressed or overwhelmed. Stressed and overwhelmed are concepts. They're, I call them bucket terms. They contain a lot of different other ideas, but um, they're different than anxious or afraid. In order to get out of the painful, raw experience of a difficult emotion, like sadness, for instance, we intellectualize with our language. We use more abstract terms that give us a little bit more distance on the feeling and help us avoid that difficult feeling. They also tend to just avoid situations and people who might trigger sadness or grief. So you tend to hang out less with that good friend because they've been through depression and it's something that they talk about, not in an unhealthy way, but it comes up from time to time. But because you're terrified of getting depressed again, you sort of avoid anyone who might talk about a lot of sadness or grief or depression. The third characteristic is what I call false positivity. This is, um, you know, people who are kind of constantly like smiling and happy and talking about how great everything is, but that it's not quite authentic. It's not that they're lying, but it's like they're trying to convince themselves of something they know isn't true deep down. And a lot of people end up doing this, taking this kind of Pollyanna-ish, everything's going to be fine, don't worry about anything, <laughs> as a way to defend against or avoid even the smallest experience of um, negativity, uh, and especially sadness or grief um, or other kind of difficult emotions like that. So they kind of crowd it all out with tons of not totally authentic positivity. Now, taken together, this these three kind of habits um, fall into the category of what I think of as grief avoidance, because they're all ultimately motivated by the desire to avoid grief or sadness. Now, the origin of this avoidance behavior comes from this one very understandable but inaccurate belief or assumption about depression that a lot of people with chronic depression have, which is that feeling sad will make me depressed. Feeling sad will make me depressed. Now, when you hear it kind of spelled out like that, you can probably start to think of all sorts of exceptions to this rule once you hear it spelled out like that um, explicitly. But a surprising number of chronically depressed people really maintain this as a core belief and they allow it to impact their actions and their behaviors. Specifically, by they tend to really avoid sadness, grief, or anything that might even trigger sadness or grief. Because again, they're terrified that it's gonna send them immediately into a spiral of depression. Now, unfortunately, as a result of all this avoidance, their brain starts to learn that sadness and grief are bad and dangerous, which makes sense if you think about it, right? If your brain sees you constantly running away from something, it's not that surprising that it's gonna to start to assume that that thing is dangerous or scary. And if that's the case, if your brain believes something, even an emotion like sadness or grief is dangerous, you're gonna to start to feel anxious about being sad or feeling grief. So the next time you feel sad, you're gonna get this kind of compound emotion of sadness plus anxiety. So your overall level of difficult emotion is way higher than it would have been normally. Again, all because of this pattern of avoidance, of running away. Grief avoidance tends to lead to a full-blown phobia of sadness. And again, this should make sense when you think about what your brain is learning based on your behavior. Now, like everybody who has a severe phobia, 
this not only makes you more and more anxious, the more you avoid something, you get temporary relief in the moment, but you get more anxious about the thing because you've taught your brain to think that it's bad. So it spirals, it gets worse and worse and worse, the anxiety does. But it also, and this is the really tragic part of it, avoidance constricts your life. It narrows your life because you start to associate more and more things with being potential triggers for sadness or grief. More and more people you start categorizing as like, uh, I'd like to spend time with them, but I don't know, we could end up talking about something really sad or difficult or so I'm just going to kind of avoid them. And remember, a lot of this is kind of unconscious. You're not literally sitting there doing a, you know, analysis of who, you know, who I'm going to spend time with or not. It's more of a thing. You, it's, it's a feeling. You just say, uh, I don't know if I want to spend time with them today. Anyway, there be all these activities and people that you start sort of shutting out of your life. And the more you do that, again, the more narrow and restricted your life becomes. Then this itself becomes a risk factor because you have fewer and fewer positive experiences in your life to buffer you from depression. Now, okay, the implication of all this is fairly straightforward if you've been following along, which is that ultimately, if you avoid grief and sadness, you will actually become more fragile and anxious. Whereas approaching your grief and sadness will ultimately make you more resilient and confident. In other words, one of the ways to be more resilient to depression is to actually spend more time with your sadness and with your grief. You don't want to wallow in them or ruminate on them unproductively, but you want to allow them, to listen to them, to be willing to feel them. And you can do this in a structured, deliberate way. Again, this is not just like wallowing in a spiral of woe is me, but you might start, you might make time every day or once or twice a week to journal about something that's sad. Or maybe you have a therapist or a counselor and you bring it up with them. You know it's uncomfortable, right? And it's kind of scary. You make time in a structured way to approach and tolerate and to be willing to have sadness and grief instead of constantly running away from it and avoiding it. Now, there's a couple benefits to doing this. The first is you're just going to learn a lot more about yourself. Your self-awareness is going to go up because despite feeling uncomfortable, sadness and grief often have a lot to teach us, including things about ourselves. The second is, and ultimately more importantly, by being willing to approach and have grief and sadness, to listen to them, to tolerate them, to be curious about them, you are changing your relationship with grief and sadness. Because again, what does your brain see? Instead of you constantly running away from sadness and grief, which just makes you more anxious and fragile, your brain sees you approaching sadness and grief. And so it learns the opposite lesson. It learns, hey, this thing, even though it's uncomfortable, like feeling sad, it's not dangerous. Like it's okay. It doesn't like instantly throw me into a spiral of depression. And when your brain learns that, you become more confident and less anxious around sadness. And as a result, your life starts to open back up again. You're less neurotic about certain people or situations being triggers for sadness and grief and therefore depression. And so you start approaching not just your emotions more, but you start approaching life more. You start living your life more fully. And when you do this, that is a huge, huge way to become more resilient to depression. So how do you actually do this? How do you get better at approaching sadness and grief instead of avoiding them? The best place to start, I think, is to work on, in very small ways, work on building the simple skill of emotional validation. Now, emotional validation, all it means is brief, when you're experiencing something diff a difficult feeling or emotion, briefly taking a second to remind yourself that it's valid to feel that way. No matter how uncomfortable or scary or painful a feeling is, including sadness or grief, just because it feels bad doesn't mean it is bad. There's lots of things in life that feel bad, but are actually really good for you. So validation just means reminding yourself it's okay to feel a difficult emotion like sadness or grief. It's not dangerous. It's not bad. It's just uncomfortable. They're perfectly normal. Everybody experiences them, and it's okay to feel that way. So this is a brief thing. You can do it in 10 seconds to remind yourself, hey, I'm feeling sad. That's okay. I don't like feeling sad. But there's nothing wrong with me. This doesn't mean something bad's gonna happen um, just because I'm feeling sad, it's normal. So to sort of sum all this up, the more you avoid grief and sadness, the more vulnerable to depression you actually become. Resilience on the other hand, including resilience to depression, comes from welcoming 
grief and sadness deliberately and building a healthier relationship with them. And one of the best ways to do this is to slowly, incrementally, build up the skill of emotional validation. All you need to know, if you struggle with chronic depression, one of the best things you can do to start turning things around is instead of assuming that you know the one thing that causes your depression, instead, consider flipping your mindset a little bit to what are the things that make me more vulnerable to depression? It's a very different way of looking at depression. Instead of assuming there's one thing that causes depression, you wanna think through there are probably dozens, maybe hundreds of things that all in relatively small ways increase my vulnerability to depression. And of course, everything from your genes to your childhood upbringing to potentially even your diet or your sleep habits, right? Some of the most impactful vulnerabilities, the most important ones, are behavioral patterns, things we're doing that are hidden in plain sight. And unlike your genes or your childhood, these have the benefit of being things you can actually control, you can change, you can do something about. And three of the most common ones that we've talked about are constant busyness, mimetic desire, and grief avoidance. The more you can become aware of these patterns and start to notice them in your life, the more you will be able to change them and modify them so that you become more resilient to depression in the future. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to learn more from me about depression and other aspects of emotional health, I write a free weekly newsletter that goes out every Monday morning. It's called The Friendly Mind, and I would love for you to join our little community. You can sign up using the link in the description below. Last thing, if you enjoyed this video, here are a couple other videos from me that I think you might also really enjoy.